Merry Christmas to you. I want to read today two different scriptures and then take a time of of prayer. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verses beginning verse 8, says, In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born to you who is the Messiah. He is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tight in cloth and lying in a manger. And we know this same Jesus in Philippians chapter 2, after around 30 plus years on this earth, the Bible says this, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is our prayer that every tongue confesses Jesus while on this earth. But we know someday in eternity that all will proclaim that Jesus is Lord. I want to ask our missionaries here at Chisholm Heights Baptist Church, Rob and Lauren and Ben and Sam Flaherty, to just to stand for a moment. They're back just for a, a short time before uh, they go back across the, the world to continue to be IMB missionaries. Thank you for your service. Uh, please know this church continues to pray for you and will. And thank you for carrying out the good news of, of Jesus. Let's, let's pray. Let's pray together today. God, you sent your only begotten son, Jesus. And Jesus, you came to this earth and you came as a baby and you lived a sinless life. And you eventually went to the cross and took our sins upon you. And, and you conquered death by rising again on the third day. And we praise you for that. We thank you today, God, that you are at the right hand of the God, the Father, and you continue to pray for us. God, we join you in praying for the Flaherty's and others of our thousands of missionaries around the world that are sharing the good news. And God, we also pray for each other, that this incredible story of great news that is all for all the people will be shared today with all so that in the name of Jesus, all can proclaim you. God, I want to close this prayer by praying for those who are going through struggles and difficulties this season. Maybe life's a little different for them or quite a bit different for them. Thank you that you don't leave us alone, that you're with us. And God, may we be hands and feet to love people well and care for people well. Thank you for this time of celebration, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.
Let's stand together as we rejoice, sing praises to the Lord for what he has done for us on that old holy night. Let's lift it up to him now. Holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and And please be seated. Choir remain standing.
open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 2 this morning. Thank you so much choir and those in instrumentals and those in the sound and all around using your gifts for the glory of glory of God and well how are the new chairs doing? Are they doing okay for everybody so far? All over we, we see those good. I expect you, if you're in the new chair, to come tell me what the message is about at the end of the service, okay? So pay close attention. You folks are off the hook here, so that's, a, that's okay. Uh, congratulations, and we're excited as we pray for God to fill up all these chairs for the, glo- for the glory of God. Today, I want us to look at what is our response to the love of God? What is our response to the Christmas story and Greater than that, what is the response that we have to all of Jesus throughout, throughout what he has done for us? I want us to look at four different stories today in Luke 2 and, and Matthew 2, four different, four different angles of those stories today. The Bible says in, in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, that in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Let's pray together. 
Would you ask God, the Holy Spirit, to just speak to you right now? In this familiar story or this new story that we're going to look at, Would you pray for somebody else right now at this Christmas season that's on your heart? And then finally, would you just pray that I'll share this message and more than that, that the Holy Spirit will speak through me for his glory. And God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, God. Thank you. You're our rock and redeemer. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Several weeks ago, I had the privilege of going to both of my grandchildren's Christmas programs. I enjoyed both of them. I could tell you a lot about them, but that's not what you showed up today to to, to hear about. But I do want to tell you one thing. We we arrived over at South, Southwest Covenant School and, and for my grandson's program, and we wanted to get there early so we could get good seats. More than that, Sherry wanted to get there early so we could get good seats. So we got there remarkably 35 minutes early, and we met the other grandparents, and we talked And they determined where we were going to sit at so we could best see Clark. In the back of my mind, I thought, that's not the best place to sit at. But that wasn't, I wasn't the one in charge that night. So I learned, I've learned through the years to step back and, 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 and wait. There's a time to speak and time to be quiet. So we got on the second row far to the left because we're going to see a good angle to the right. Clark comes in, and we did get to wave, and he waved at us, and that's always very important. Uh, But then we sat down, and right in front of Clark was this big old microphone, and I couldn't see one thing. And I had chosen to be a servant and sit at the end of the row, and I couldn't see that rascal at all. And, you know, a, a, a spiritual, godly man who calls himself a preacher obviously isn't going to whine and get bitter and not enjoy the Christmas program. But that's what happened. <laughs> All I could think about for the first part of their program, well, if, if I would have been in charge, we would sit right in the middle, about the fifth row, right, right here where you guys are at. There's no way we could have missed Clark. But then about halfway through the program, as we're watching, all of a sudden it hit me. You know, Griff, I'm going to trust this was the Holy Spirit. You know, Griff, it's really not a big deal that you can see Clark. What is a big deal is that Clark can see you. Now He knows that Grandpa's there or Pa's there in this case. And that someday that'll make a difference to him. So for the rest of the night, I turned it upside down and I was thrilled. And in the program, we hugged and we watched him run up and down the stairs and have fun. And we bragged on him a hundred times, just as you would do. And he did an awesome job. Because I changed my response. My first response was, was it a response of selfishness and pride and Ego, and my second response was the better response. It was more Christ-like. What is our response going to be this Christmas? You know, in the New Testament story, as we look at God's love, there are several people who had to make responses. In the first story, there were the innkeepers that had to make the stories. Even though we don't know who, who these folks were, we do know that Joseph had gone up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David in Bethlehem because he was a house of family line. He'd gone there to be registered for the census with Mary. They were betrothed together to him, and she was pregnant, and the time came for Jesus to be born. And the Bible says that she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room. There was no room for them in the inn. There was not a place available that we would call a VRBO or a bed and breakfast or anything like that. 
The first response of some people that probably didn't mean anything by it is there was just no room for the Savior. There's no room for Jesus. And in all likelihood, this wasn't like a Motel 6. It was a room off of a house, not a fancy room at all. It's called a catalema. It's like a guest room or, or a small, not fancy room. But the town was booked and crowded because people had showed up for the census. And the first, the first response of these people was there's no room for Jesus. So that, that just leads me to ask for us a question this, this Christmas. Are we making room for Jesus in our life? What is your response to the Savior coming? Do you have time for Jesus? Even in this busy Christmas, Christmas, you know, like Christ, Christmas season, do we have time for Jesus or are we squeezing Jesus out of our life? Have we quit following Jesus? At one time, Jesus was a priority and he was involved in our life, but now we've quit following Jesus. Or, or maybe this might be the case, my friends. I have plenty of room for Jesus in this Sunday morning room and, and on the Wednesday room and hanging around my Christian friend's room. And, but there's this one room that I really don't have room for Jesus in. The first response was there's no room for Jesus what is our response this Christmas season? But then, then there's a second response, and it's found further on in Luke, Luke um, chapter 2. It says, In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. We talked about that last week. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Praise be to God, the word all is mentioned there, for all, all nations. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born to you who is the Messiah, the Lord. The second response, the second response of the shepherds was, let's go straight to Jesus, Look at verse 13. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to the people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the, 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 the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened which the Lord has made known to us. Now get this. These shepherds were not people that we would call godly people. We talked about that last week. We don't know where they're at in their spiritual life, but we would, we would trust that not all of them had faith in Jesus. They also would call come more from being on the poor side or not looked at by society very well. They were confronted with Jesus in, in a strong way as the angels came. And what was their response? They went straight to Bethlehem. They said, okay, we've heard about Jesus, but now we're going to meet him personally. We're going to find out about Jesus personally. I love that word straight. They didn't linger and they took off. Maybe some of the shepherds led the way and others followed. Maybe they all wanted to go at the same time. What happened with the sheep? Are you ready? I don't know. But I do know this. They prioritize of going straight to see Jesus. Made me think of, of, of three people. A young lady named Allie Talbot had visited Waterloo Road Baptist Church one, one Sunday and on the next, next evening, my wife and, and another lady went and she had filled out some information, went and visited with her. And Sherry shows back up that night and says to me, Griff, we knocked on Allie's door and she opened up the door and she said, what are you doing here? And they said, well, you visited church yesterday. And she said, I know. I prayed today that somebody would come and tell me about Jesus. And in the next hour, Allie came to know Christ Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Allie's husband today is a youth minister somewhere in Oklahoma. I forgot where that was at, and we praise God for that testimony. 
Several years ago, Jim Riggs, who I mentioned earlier, he came to the Christmas musical, much like your wonderful Christmas musical. And Jim Riggs was sitting in the audience, and as we gave the invitation, Jim walked up and said, hey, I, I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And uh, Jim was a model servant as he lived his life for the Lord Jesus. I thought this week of a young man named Johnny who was in the youth group years ago that, that I showed up at church on Sunday morning down in the youth building, used to be the youth building, the condemned building that's, that's over there somewhere now uh, that, that I used to hang out at quite a bit. And, and, and Johnny came up to me and he says, hey, today's a day that I need to come to know Jesus. Well, Johnny, I got to teach Sunday school first and I got to do this first. No. We went and we talked about Jesus and he came to know Christ as his Lord and Savior. So friends, you might be here today and you've heard the Christmas story. You know the story. You've been confronted with it and you've heard it and you've loved it. But today is a day you go, I got to go straight to Jesus. It's not about Chisholm Heights Baptist Church. It's not about me preaching. It's not about your Sunday school teacher or your parents or, or, or your children. It's you. You go, Jesus came for me, and I've got to go straight to him. Boys and girls learn the gospel this way, that we must, A, admit that we are sinners. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and the letter B means this, that we must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he came to this world and, and died for our sins, buried and rose again. And then the word C is that we confess or we claim or we call upon Jesus to save us. I know you know this, but let me tell you one more time. We cannot be good enough. There'll never be a day. There'll never be a moment. Don't wait until you get some things in order. Oh, I want to go to Jesus, but first I got to stop doing this and this and this. Friends, if we could stop sinning, we wouldn't need Jesus. We go straight to Jesus and we confess our sins and we ask him to become our king and our Lord and our Savior. The second response of the shepherds who didn't show up that day to meet the angels and go to Bethlehem. They showed up that evening to do their work just like they had many times before. But that night they were confronted and called upon to go straight to Jesus and they said yes. Hey, maybe you're a believer but, and, and you know you're a believer but, but straight to Jesus means, you know, I need to get my life in order. I, Last time I prayed or read the Bible, which is so important on a regular basis, i got to go straight back to Jesus first thing in the morning or as I get going in the day. Or I've got to follow him in this way in my life. I've been wandering off the path and, and chasing other things in this world as a believer. and I need to deny myself and follow Jesus and go straight to Jesus. I need to take up my cross daily. Or, hey, maybe you need to be one of those great people who've known Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you've never been baptized. Let me make sure you understand. Baptism is a symbol, but not just a symbol, right? It's an important symbol. Much like this wedding ring, it's just this important symbol that proclaims, I'm a believer in Jesus. Let me make sure you understand that I say this in love. We're commanded to be baptized as a believer. Unless there's some reason we just can't, we're called upon to confess Jesus by being baptized. I'm going to go straight to Jesus by following him. Maybe we go straight to Jesus by all the way over in verse, in verse 20. Would you go to verse 20 of Luke 2? It's almost the very end of the story. They went to Jesus. They found Mary and Joseph, verse 16. They found the baby Jesus. They heard of the message, 16, 17. They were amazed at that. Verse 20 says this, The shepherd returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which was just as they had been told. What did they do? They told people they had gone straight to Jesus. 
One of the ways that we love God is is to share our love for God, and and we share the story of Jesus, and not just our our great friends who are missionaries around this world, praise God for them, but every day in our our life, we tell the story of how we've gone straight to Jesus and what Jesus has gone for us. See, some people know that Jesus is around, but they just have no room for Jesus, Other people find out about Jesus surprisingly at times, and they go straight to Jesus. And then thirdly, there's those who say, I am disturbed by Jesus. Look over the book of Matthew. We'll spend the rest of our time there, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Herod's story is, I'm disturbed by Jesus. The gospel of Matthew, the good news of Jesus about, through Matthew says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jer- Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at his rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Well, first of all, Herod was deeply disturbed. But the reason Jerusalem was also disturbed is they were scared. Because see, Herod had done some good things. But Herod was a man who was insanely jealous and was angry. He killed his three wi- his wife, three kids, his brother-in-law. Julius Caesar had appointed Herod's father. And, and the people in Jerusalem knew that when Herod got disturbed, it wasn't going to be good for them. That's why all in Jerusalem were disturbed and They were disturbed about what Herod was about to do. And we'll talk a little bit more about what these wise men did in a moment. But if you'll go down to verse 16, I'm sorry, let's go to verse 13. It says, after they were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and saying, get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. See, Herod was so disturbed that someone was coming that might take his place that he wanted to kill Jesus. And he so wanted to kill Jesus that he asked the wise men to go and be an undercover spy, go and find out about Jesus, but then come back and tell me. There's different opinions if the wise men knew what was going on with Herod and they didn't want to go back or they chose for other reasons. We're not absolutely sure. I I believe there was some kind of connection there that they understood But I do know this, that verse 16 says, Then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage, and he gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time he had learned from the wise men. Some people are disturbed by Jesus even today. Jesus claiming that he is on the throne and that he is God and we can only be saved through Jesus. Jesus who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except to me. He who says, I am the Father or one. He who went to the cross for our sin and the cross is offensive to people. There are many who would say, I'm disturbed by Jesus. So, is that you today? I would say most in this 
service today wouldn't be disturbed by Jesus. But if you are, thank you for being here. And I'm sincere in that. Please, please know that Jesus speaks truth and we believe that truth. We believe he's the only way. We believe that we must follow him. We believe that he's our only way to salvation. We believe that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But please hear this. We're not standing here saying we're better than you. We're standing here saying that all of us together need Jesus. And if you would be so kind or desire to visit with myself or someone else, we would love to develop, I believe, a friendship and be able to talk about that. Because the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And each of us are sinners and we all must turn around and come to know Jesus. And we turn away from our sin and ourself. And none of us are any better than others. I'm reading a book right now by Philip Yancey. It's called Amazing Grace. It's been around a long time. But as I read it just over and over again about, about grace and about grace and about grace and about forgiveness and forgiveness. And we ask the question in that book, where is too good, good enough to go to Jesus? Where is good enough to be able to be with God? Is, is it Hitler? Well, some would say, no way, Hitler. Okay, well, well, back a little bit, back a little bit more. How far do we go? Where is that line that crosses in the sand? Is it more good deeds than bad deeds that gets us to Jesus? Well, uh, while that sounds good, most people would say, I'm on the good side of that. But if you're on the good side of that, it can't be more, it has to be equal I want to present to you Jesus who just says it's a free gift. By grace we are saved through faith and this not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not that anyone can boast. And Church, hear this. Much like I showed up and I was sitting in the wrong spot at the Christmas program and I was kind of bothered by it. Sometimes non-believers, how, how they respond and what they say and how they mock Jesus and it starts out making us mad and I'm not saying we shouldn't be bothered by it but can I challenge us and I said us Jesus loves those people and we are those people without Jesus we're all sinners May all of us say, hey, how can I show people the love of Jesus even when they don't want to receive it? Jesus on the cross is offensive to people, but they still need Jesus. Don't be surprised how lost people respond to the gospel. Realize a persecuted church around this world is going through that, and occasionally we get a taste of that. Some people respond to, I just don't have room for Jesus. And the shepherds respond to, let's go straight to Jesus. And King Herod said, I'm disturbed by Jesus. And finally, the wise men said, we will worship Jesus. Look at verse 9 through 12. After Herod sent them on their way in Matthew 2, he says, after hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at his rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and, and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in the dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Did they know about Herod before the dream? We, we don't know that for sure, perhaps, but we do know that then. A couple things. Many times we think there's three wise men. We really don't know how many, many wise men there, there were. Okay. Secondly, uh, we, we, we think these wise men, uh, maybe some people would think, oh, it happened, but it says it was at a house, okay? 
It could have been more than years. It could have been up to the two years. We, we, um, we, we don't know for sure, but we know that Jesus was in the house now in all likelihood with some kind of a toddler when this happened. But the wise men went, and who were these wise men? We're not for sure, much like the shepherds. I don't believe all these wise men were, were three men or, or seven men that were just strong followers of Jesus. I don't, I don't believe that or were people of faith. There could have been intermixed, but we do know that they had studied and they had learned and they had heard about, and then they themselves found Jesus. And they lived their life saying, we will worship Jesus. See, they were seeking Jesus. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse, verse 13 tells us, t- tells us that. It says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your hearts. And if you're really interested in finding out about Jesus, I just encourage you, really dig into it, ask, ask questions. Now, these magi had studied astrology. Old Testament had mocked astrology some. Matthew knew this, but he doesn't mock mock these um, uh, wise men. He didn't condemn them. He says that these men are people who worship Jesus. They could be more on the wealthy side or more on the knowledge side. And maybe your life and the Bible, you've said, You've said, I I, I know about this, but it's wrong. I can't figure it out. There's something that doesn't, doesn't make sense. Can I urge you? Look at Jesus. Find out about Jesus. Worship Jesus. Believers, may we worship with value Jesus. May we talk about his love strong as we worship Worship in singing, but worship in our life. We, we studied this a few weeks ago. I'm sure you remember, right? Romans chapter 12, verse, verse 1 and 2 tells us, tells us what our attitude. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, remember those views in the first 11 of chapters? I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be condemned to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. How do we live our life when we find Jesus? We live our life as a life of worship. Worship in all that we do. We don't let other things get in our way. We don't respond like our spirit tells us to respond. Why? Why? Because we know Jesus is present with us. And the Holy Spirit lives with us. So, this Christmas, what is your response to Jesus? Have you made room for him in your life? Or is there no room for Jesus? Have you chosen to go straight to Jesus? Honestly, are you disturbed by Jesus? Or you are, are you disturbed by those who are disturbed by Jesus? And fourthly, will you go and worship Jesus? So that Christmas program was over. <clears throat> Our grandson came up to us. And you know what I told him? I said, Clark... I had the worst seats in the house, man. I couldn't see you. Everybody else messed up. Did I say that? No. You know what I said? Paul saw you. And Paul was proud of you. And you know that Paul loves you no matter what. You know what God looks at us believers as? He sees that other junk in our life. It's called a sin. We need to repent daily of that. But you know what he says to us? I've covered those sins. You know what, Griff? I love you. I believe in you. Make a difference in this world for me. You can do it. Story of Jesus. What is our response to him? Let's pray.
you showed up on Christmas Eve and Jesus has spoke to you through the Holy Spirit, through music, through Sunday school, through message, through scripture. And man, you got to come right to Jesus. Don't wait a second longer. You don't have to take 10 steps. Call on him to save you right now. Confess your sins. Admit you sin. Believe in Jesus. Confess him as your Lord and Savior. Chris and Jeff are here. When we stand, come, come and share that. Come and worship Jesus. Maybe you realize there's another response of baptism or joining this church or committing in some special way to, to follow him. And but this is the central part of our faith in our world. What will be our response to Jesus? Just a second, I'm going to pray. Then we're going to sing. I urge you to worship him and by following him, by singing, by doing exactly what he calls you to do. If we can help in any way, let me know. Please stand to your feet. Jesus, thank you that you love us. And while we're yet sinners, you died for us. And God, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit will show us truth about our salvation, will show us truth about our response to you. And thank you, Jesus, that your response to us is you love us. We praise you as we sing. We respond with a strong yes. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you for joining us online today. We hope that the Lord spoke to your heart through this message. If you would like to speak to someone today about a decision you feel led to make or for someone to pray with you, please call our church office as we have somebody that would love to talk with you. For more information about Chisholm Heights, please check out our website at chvcmustang.org. We hope that you will join us again in person or online next week.